Welcome to the episode of Jim's Lumber Garden. Okay, so Jason Smith put a comment on uh, the last video and uh, just said what do you do with all of the produce when you make it. So I thought I'd start with the tomatoes. So we're in here in the greenhouse um, and I don't know if you can see, I'll just turn the camera around a little bit. You can see here the, um, the tomatoes are you know, sort of more than ready. And what, basically to pick, um, uh, to pick tomatoes all you, all you do is you can see just above the tomato there there's a bit of a um, like a joint in the, in the stem too. So if you, if you turn the tomato up like that, it'll basically break off, and you know you can you can take that off with the tomato, or you can actually leave it on the plant. All you need to do is just sort of pull the tomato like that, and it'll release from the plant anyway. It's not really any bother if you leave that part on the plant. Okay, and what I do is I basically pick off the tomatoes um, off the plant like that, um, and put them into a into a big bowl. And if you can see, I've got a big bowl here. Uh, and I can, when you grow as many tomatoes as I do, you typically get, um, you know, a few kilos in one go. Uh, particularly if you've been on um, holiday like I just have, um, you typically come back to quite a few tomatoes. Now I have already picked quite a few, um, but it's it's within my interest today to get the rest off. So I thought I'd do a quick clip for you. Now, as soon as you pick tomatoes, there's lots of things you can do with tomatoes. Obviously, you can use them fresh. Um, but when you've when you've got the volume like I've got here, um, you know you can't you know you basically can't eat them all. So there's a number of ways that you can uh, you can preserve tomatoes. Obviously, there's there's all sorts of chutneys and things like that that you can make with tomatoes. But that's not always everybody's um, um, sort of you know want if you like. So I just wanted to explain what I do with the tomatoes. Obviously, I, I get quite a lot. Um, now what I have done this year. Um, you can preserve them in two main ways really, and I use a freezer to preserve mine. Uh, what you can do is you can chop them up into quarters, or, or even leave them whole if you wish, but I typically cut them into quarters, then into eighths. So I'll sort of cut it square and then that way as well. And you want to pick the tomato when it's reasonably um, firm. If it, if it goes too far, um, and it's sort of really deep red, um, this one's gone quite far. You can feel that it's quite soft, so when you're cutting it up, uh, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with that um, tomato, but you can get tomatoes that are overripe, really. Um, and what I do is I cut them into quarters. Obviously, if it was a tomato that size, I'll just leave it and just put that straight in. And then bag them up into one kilo bags, which, to be honest with you, with, with tomatoes, you, you don't need many tomatoes to make up a kilo. Um, and sort of chop them up into quarters. You don't need to do anything with them at all. Um, just take them straight off the plant. You can give them a bit of a wash if you've if you've used anything in the greenhouse. But as I as I've not used anything in the greenhouse, um, I typically just give them um, a quick swirl with the tap, chop them up, um, put them in a bag, and put them in the freezer. The second thing you can do now they're great for a number of things. You know you can make all sorts of curries, chilies, um, and you know all, basically all you need to do is take them straight out of the freezer, give them give them a few hours to defrost, and then put them. As they are straight into your, um, your chilies or your curries or any pasta dish or anything like that, um, and what the what the tomatoes will do is obviously break down in the um, break down in your cooking mix and make a really nice sauce. Um, and obviously, when you freeze stuff, you do preserve a lot of the a lot of the um, the vitamins and vitamins that are in um, in tomatoes and other fruits. So you know, there's you know, if you can't use them all in one go, obviously fresh is always best. Uh, but if you can't use them, you know, all in one go because you've got so many of them, freezing them is is quite possibly the best 
way of uh, preserving the, uh, the, you know, the vitamins and the goodness. Now, as soon as you cook anything, you destroy the vitamins and stuff in there. So, if you can chop them up and freeze them as they are, that's the best way of storing the vitamins. And they will obviously store in the freezer for 12 months or more. Um, the other thing you can do is make a sauce out of them. Um, now, there's a, there's a few different ways of doing this. Um, you know, you can add vinegar or you can add um, various herbs and spices in there as well if you wish, and obviously pepper. Uh, but what I typically do is, because I don't know what I'm going to use the, um, the tomato puree for in the end, if you like, is I typically just do tomatoes on their own, and there's no, there's no reason why you can't do that. Um, and all I do is I chop the tomatoes up, skins and all, um, and put them into a, a big sort of boiling vat, if you like. Uh, which typically holds about um, probably about two gallons, so it's quite a big big pot. And I'll let that I'll let that come to the boil, and then I simmer it for about um, for about three or four hours um, on the stove. And literally just simmer, stir it every quarter of an hour or so. And what that will do is it'll reduce down. Even the skins will start to dissolve. Um, and then what you can do is with a handheld liquidizer. Just go through and just basically give it a quick um, liquidise with a handheld liquidizer, and that will um, that will sort of break break down any other you know the sort of the seeds or anything like that. Obviously, you can go to more bother. You can um, drop them into boiling water um, and then quickly take them out. And what that will do is it'll make the skins of the tomatoes split, and you can actually peel the skin off the tomato. But having said that. The majority of the goodness is actually in the skin of the tomato, so really I like to um, leave the skins in there as much as I can. Obviously what you don't want to have is lots of skin, so that's why you need to boil it for sort of four hours or so. But by cooking it, you are most certainly destroying the, um, you know, the vitamins and that in there. So that's, that's not the best way, you know, from a health point of view of, of storing tomatoes. The best way is literally just to chop them up, put them in a bag and put them straight into the freezer. And then as you're cooking whatever um, you know you can you know you can just just take them out a few hours before let it defrost and then put that into your cooking cook it up and then obviously you, you know you've you, you've effectively got fresh tomatoes now, okay so I've picked all the tomatoes you can see what I've done um, is I've left on the ones like these here um, as you can see there they're just starting to turn uh, so what I've done is I've left the odd the odd red one I know there's one over here this is a, um, a gardener's delight a little one um, but the ones that are just starting to turn, I've left those on obviously. Uh, now you could, you know, if it was right at the back end of the year, you could potentially just take them off. Obviously you can eat tomatoes green or red, they don't have to be red. So, you know, if you do have a few green ones, there's no reason why you can't put those in with the cooking as well. Um, but any that are sort of like these here, then if you can see those there. Um, I've left those on because those tomatoes going ripe are going to send the, the ones that are still green um, ripe. And so I've I've basically just picked um, that bowl full there. Obviously these are the these are the uh, the money maker tomatoes. So that's a nice sized tomato. Uh, and these smaller ones here, those are the um, gardener's delight. There are a, the odd alicante in there as well, um, but the alicantes are kind of about that size. That's that's about the, as big as they've got this year. But as you can see, those are still sort of turning really. There's not so many of those ready yet. But the money makers, I've left those as they are. And what I'll be doing with those is chopping all those up, putting them into bags and freezing them as they are. Um, that is most certainly the easiest and less time consuming way of doing it. So then, all you need to do then is put that straight into your cooking, as I say, um, you, you know, to cook your sauce. You do get a reasonable amount of water out of them, so if you are cooking with them, uh, you don't need much more, you know, water than what's, you know, what's in the tomato. Obviously, if you reduce it down, like I say, you know, you stew it up and make a puree out of it, that drives the water out. But from a a labour and a, a health perspective, the best thing to do with tomatoes, I feel, is just to give them a quick wash, chop them up and freeze them, then you've got the most amount of goodness in there and it's the least amount of work to prepare them. Okay, so moving on to the potatoes. Um, last night I dug up half a row of... Um, these are the Maris Piper potatoes. And to be honest with you, I wasn't impressed at all. From from uh, this this half row here and these couple of plants here, I basically got about a bucket full of um, a bucket full of potatoes, and I would have expected um, out of a row, I would have got at least a sack, um, you know, sort of 
uh, what would be in a sack, 20 kilos of potatoes, 25 kilos of potatoes I would have expected from a row. Um, I've probably got about um, probably about four, four or five kilos out of this this part that I dug here. So I've, I've basically dug a row out, and uh, I basically got um, like a bucket full of potatoes. So wasn't overly impressed with those. Now I know this year is not a good year for potatoes. Uh, my uh, my neighbour he's already dug his potatoes up, and uh, he's had a he's had a really bad year for potatoes. And it's basically because we had such a dry. Um, spring and early part of the summer which is when the potatoes are swelling um, that um, you know the potatoes didn't develop anywhere near as well as they, they, they really should have done so what I'm going to do now is um, whilst I'm videoing I'm going to dig up um, a, f um, a couple of plants of the um, the purple majestic which are planted if I remember correctly in these two rows here so these two are purple majestic at least the first few are and then um, and then the rest of the row are kestrel, which are the variety I normally grow, which are actually a second early, but I grow them as main crop. Um, so what I'll do is I'll dig up a few of the um, plants from here now, uh, whilst I'm recording, and then I'll um, dig up a few from there, so you can actually see what the uh, what, what the potatoes actually look like. But I'm not expecting too much from what I saw yesterday. Okay, so these are, to the best of my knowledge, perfect majestic. I'll soon know when I start digging them. Just pulled out the. Uh, the marker pole from the end of the row. And what I typically do is, obviously there's the plant there, I'm about a foot behind it, and what you want to do is just put your put your fork in there um, and just pull the pull the soil out like that. Now there's a potato there, which is green. Right, so the potato should be now in this next forkful. Now, always go steady when you're doing this, because this is the time you'll break a fork if you're not careful. Okay, so, as I thought there are the potatoes, they're not very big. That's the what's left of the seed potato there. Um, but they're not very big at all. Now, that's what I was kind of seeing yesterday with the uh, the Maris Parker potatoes. There are potatoes there, but they are quite small. Um, so I seem to be getting a lot of really small potatoes. They're not very big at all. Obviously the sea potatoes they put in here were almost baker's size. Now there's a big potato here. That is a uh, that's a kestrel. I don't know if you can see, but there's a slight purple tinge there, you know, which is telling me that's a potato that I left in last year and it's grown through. I always grow the potatoes in the same place. So they're actually kestrel potatoes, which always seem to do well in my ground. They're very good for slug resistance and also um, they're, uh, um, they're also, um, you know, nice potatoes for baking and um, they're, they're good for chipping. I don't chip them myself, I don't, I don't cook chips, but um, the, uh, they're good for baking or roasting or boiling. Uh, they're quite a floury potato. These Purple Majestic with some that I'd got left over from cooking, that's not a bad sized potato really. So, I'll just go for the second bit here. As soon as you've got the first plant out, it is a bit easy because what you do is you turn over onto where you've just been. So, there's not a plant here, so I'm not expecting there to be any potatoes. I'm just making sure though, you never know. Right, that's definitely a kestrel. As you can see, that purpling round where the eyes would be. That's definitely kestrel potato. Um, that's a purple majestic, obviously. Again, a very small potato there. That's another kestrel. And the one tip I will give with potatoes is when you think you've got the last potato out, dig it over again because there's probably another one. I always seem to I always seem to leave potatoes in the ground and then the following year I get potatoes coming up. Right. So there should be another plant here. It's 
really hot today. It's actually 25 degrees at the moment. So this isn't the best weather to dig potatoes in. Okay, that's a purple majestic there. But as you can see, that this is a really poor crop that we've had this year. Uh, some more. I'll show you what's in the bucket in a minute. So when the crop is like this, the best way to dig potatoes up is slowly, don't overdo it. Because you can you can get yourself into trouble if you're not proper, if, you know, if you're not careful. Even the fittest people don't do well in this weather. Right. There's more kestrel than, uh, than anything here, I think. Okay, so I think I've got all the potatoes out of there then. So I'll just do this one last plant. Hardly worth bothering with too honest. Even if you get little potatoes like that, it's worth getting them out of the ground because they will grow again next year if you're not careful. Even one the size of a pea will try to grow. And you end up with potatoes everywhere if you're not careful. Right. Okay, I think I've got them all there. So, that's the potatoes out of effectively three plants. So we've got some kestrel, I don't know if you can see those, um, but really that should be, I would normally expect more potatoes than that off one plant, let alone off three plants. So in summary, uh, the potatoes don't seem to have done so well here. So what I'll do now is I'll dig um, some of the kestrel row up there and I'll show you in comparison what we get out of those. Okay then, so what to do um, with your potatoes as soon as you've dug them up. So I have just dug up, following on from the previous clip, I have just dug up a root of um, kestrel and I add basically those four, um, I, add, I add something like that from one root. So that really that's not bad for, um, for a kestrel plant. Um, I have had much better than that, but uh, anyway, I'm, I'm happy with that because from the uh, the Maris Piper, um, one plant basically gave me that. So, you know, and those two plants were next to each other. So, you know, that, that, that just goes to show that kestrel really suits my ground. Obviously, in different parts of the country, different varieties will suit your ground best, but I found kestrel is best suited for my ground. So, what to do with potatoes as soon as you've dug them up? Number one, irrespective of what you're going to do with them, unless you're going to use them straight away, the first thing you need to do is get them dry. So what you need to do is, if you've got a nice day like today and the ground's dry, then your potatoes have come out nice and clean like that. Um, they're already dry. Um, so what I would tend to do is just to lay them out on the ground and just make sure that they're absolutely dry, because any moisture um, that's on the potato will cause all sorts of problems like mould, um, mildew, rot and all, all that kind of stuff. The second thing you need to look for if you're going to store a potato is the potato needs to be completely free of any kind of um, any problem. So there's no slug holes in it, there's no uh, there's no rot, there's no you know there's no nothing nasty. Because if you've got if you've got one bad potato in the sack that one bad potato will send all the rest of them bad as well. So you need to make sure that every potato that goes into the sack for storage is going to be absolutely you know a1 condition if it's not use it straight away obviously if there's any potatoes that are slightly dodgy or you've got a slug hole in them or something like that then keep them in a bucket and use them first store all the good ones the third tip i can give you is potatoes do bruise um, it's not easy to bruise them but don't throw them about when you're digging them up place them in the bucket as opposed to throw them in the bucket um, because they 
you know, they're not as easy to bruise as things like apples and things like that, but potatoes will bruise. If you're going to use them straight away, it doesn't really matter. If, you, if you're planning to store them, you need to make sure that they're kept um, bruised free, basically. So, what I, considering all of that, what I tend to do is to sort potatoes into three different sorts. The first one are potatoes that can be used for uh, baking and things like that and that's um, potatoes that are kind of that big. Um, so they're ideal for uh, peeling and baking or, or boiling or whatever, making mashed potato and things like that. Um, any potatoes that are kind of that size or thereabouts, so anything from, from kind of that to probably that big, um, I will put those into one sack or, or, or one group of sacks. Um, the second set of potatoes are potatoes that can be used for baking, so potatoes kind of like that, um, or, or bigger, um, those are ideal for baking. Um, and then potatoes that are uh, a bit smaller, um, say potatoes like that, can be used straight away. So you can basically, as you dig these out of ground, these are really nice just to, just to wash them off, scrub the skins, um, and then put, you, you, know, you can then just boil them straight up and use them bake them or whatever. Any potatoes that are smaller than that, for example like that, I would then put that into a separate sack or even bucket um, and those will go for my seed potatoes next year. So anything that's much smaller than that, um, something like that, is, isn't any good for anything so those may as well go on the compost heap. Um, any potatoes that are kind of from kind of that size to that size are ideal for seed um, potatoes that are kind of that size, I'd use straight away or, or bag them up and you can just, just, just wash them off. Um, and then obviously potatoes like that are good for, um, you know, for baking. The other thing that I will say is when you're storing potatoes, what you need to do is when the potatoes are young, the skins are quite soft and you can tell this just by scratching the side of a uh, potato, the skin will come off really easily. If that's the case, you need to leave them to for the skins to harden. Uh, the best left in the ground so what you know leave it till later to dig them up if you're going to store them. If you're going to eat them straight away dig them straight out the ground and eat them. Um, the best off in the ground until you use them so just use them straight out the ground. Um, if you are going to store them leave them in the ground for a little bit longer leave it till kind of beginning of September like I have. The reason being is that the beginning of September typically the ground is reasonably still dry so the potatoes will come out quite cleanly. If you leave it till kind of November, December time, even though you can, you're more likely to get things like slugs eating into them and also the ground will be wet so it'll be harder to dig them out and the potatoes will come out dirty so you'll need to wash them. Um, but if you can get them out now, they'll, they'll come out nice and clean. You can dry them off, let the skins harden for a couple of days in a, in a tub like this and then you can then sack them up and then they'll, they'll, they'll store really well. So now really is the ideal time to dig out your main crop. Um, or, you, or your second earlies if you're going to store them. Um, and that's really all there is to storing potatoes. Obviously what you need to do as soon as they're in the sacks you need to keep them as cool but frost free as possible. Um, an ideal place would be a, um, a brick built garage or, um, or a shed where it's not too warm. What you, you definitely want to keep them below kind of 15 degrees, don't let them get above that because that's when um, you know they will potentially start to shoot again and stuff like that. Then the second thing is you need to keep them in the dark. So if you if you haven't got them sealed in sacks and you've got them in buckets or whatever, what you need to do is keep them in a dark green, um, a dark shed. Cover the window over. Um, it hasn't got to be absolutely pitch black, but what they can't be is in daylight because the um, the skins will start to form the, um, and, and go green, which is poisonous. So any green potatoes discard straight away. And that's really all the tricks for storing potatoes. Okay, so as you can see, a lot of the potatoes are out now. I've still got three rows at the end here to get out. Um, but I just wanted to quickly point out that if you're, um, if you're not going to um, get them out and the weather's going to turn bad on you, I'll just put some plastic over, which will keep the ground dry. And then uh, I'll be able to come up, pull the plastic back and be able to dig the potatoes out um, after it's rained. Okay, so once the potatoes are dug up, I'll put them in these um, tubs. Any that I manage to catch with the fork, I'll put them in there. But I'll leave them in here till they dry. So I've got some more in there that's are drying. Um, some more in there, there that's are drying. Um, and then as soon as they've dried, I'm going to sort them and put them into paper sacks like this. 
and then just just um, I've, I've got them over the top there just obviously just to keep the light from them and then as soon as they've dried out put them into the sacks make sure the sacks are folded over at the top so there's no light in there and they should be stored as I said before in a you know as cool a condition as possible and then uh, they should keep for a good six months okay so as you can see the butternut squashes have um, ripened on the plant um, they're nowhere near as big as they were last year but uh, before it rains tomorrow what I'm going to do is take all of these out um, as you can see there there's some some good sized ones on there as well um, and there's one up the back there um, and one over there so what I'll do now is just take them off uh, with a pair of secateurs you want to take off so there's about an inch of the uh, the stalk left over and then these can be um, there's a very easy way of cooking this if you like butternut squash soup all you need to do is cut cut it in half lengthways along there um, scoop out the seeds and then put it into the oven for around 30 minutes um, and then um, take it out of the oven scoop the um, scoop the contents out from the uh, the skin and then all you need to do is just um, quickly whiz that up with a blender and you've got some really nice butternut squash soup. You can put all sorts of spices in there. Um, you can put turmeric in there, you can put um, well, various spices, whatever you, whatever takes your fancy really. And then uh, so that's a really easy way um, to, to prepare your butternut squash. So as I say, just cut it lengthways like that, put it into a baking tray. You could brush it with oil at the top and then um, 30 minutes out, scoop all the insides out, put it into a bowl or a container, liquidise it and then uh, you, can, um, you can eat it straight away like that and basically you need to add nothing else to it. If you're not going to eat them straight away, these will store quite nicely, um, just take them off the plant, keep them in a nice dry, um, not, so, uh, you know, not so bright place, of, uh, you know, so the inside the house will be um, fine and these will store um, for about six months or so just as they are, just, just left exactly as they are. Okay, so I'm just going to store them in the uh, the greenhouse, uh, like that on the surface, um, and they'll they'll store quite nicely in here. Just just let them ripen off till they're till they're perfectly um, brown, so there's no stripiness in them. And then um, I'll take them down to the house and um, use them in the next few months. So I hope this episode was of some use to you. Please don't hesitate to put any comments or questions you've got below and I'll always get back to you. And I'll see you on the next episode of Jim's Up and Garden. Mm -hmm.